Everyone has a story. Some people have a story worth telling. Some people have stories they would rather not tell. The decisions you make today will determine the stories you tell tomorrow. A successful life is not made up of a few big decisions, but of hundreds and hundreds of small ones. What will your story be? My story, living the story you want to tell. So this morning has been very interesting. So for those of you who were here uh, as we were doing worship this morning and getting ready for practice, everybody knows that I was technologically challenged this morning. And so we got here and I got up this morning and I wanted to set some things. Actually, this began last night. So I'm telling you guys a story since we've been talking about stories the last few weeks. And I said, hey, you know what? Why don't I come here to the church and get things set up for Sunday morning because, you know, the building will be empty. It'll be nice. It's always nice to be inside the house of God when it's quiet. You can pray, listen to your music, prepare things, pray some more. And I opted not to. And I said, well, it's no problem. I get here in the morning and everything will fly smoothly. And everybody who knows that when you are up against a hard deadline, hard stop, you know things begin to go wrong. So when I got here, I began to have many technology challenges this morning. And so I was a little bit befuddled when the worship team came in and I was trying to, or Marissa came in first and I was trying to, no, Melody came in first and then Marissa came in later. But when Melody got here, I'm like, my head's in the computer. I'm trying to get things done and things are going wrong. And I'm like, oh. And... I had to remind myself, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And as I got that and got to that point, and then uh, Sherry and Matt came in, and the other folks began to come in, and everything began to kind of flow together. We got into worship practice. We had a wonderful time of worship in practice, and then a wonderful time of worship with you guys this morning. God is great. Amen? Amen. He is the great I am, as we sang this morning. Amen? He's able to cover everything. But because of my technology challenges, I had also made a decision while I've been watching this set up here as the little video plays and we've got the little typewriter guy there that I would bring and show you guys something, a a connected story, so to speak, with one of our members here in the church. This was given to me by a member in the church and not in its pristine form did he find it. So he sent me a couple of shots of the before of keys that had mold all over them and mechanic works that were all in various states of disrepair. But he took the time and over the course of some months actually did the work to bless me because I love writing. And because of my technology challenges, this is about the speed that I need to be at today. And so I had this And I love it, by the way, and it works. So I'm going to put a piece of paper in here just for my own self because this thing is wonderful, and I use it, and my kids actually uh, think it's theirs, but it's not. Um, But it has a carriage return. even plays the bell when you get to the end of the line. For those of you who remember typewriters, man, this thing is great. And so what I did last night as I was kind of working this, I said, you know what, I'm going to do something that I haven't done in a long time. And I wrote something in what I call the five, uh, five minute drill. And I'll tell you about the five minute drill in a minute. But I want to read to you what I wrote and what came to me as I was kind of writing out the narrative portion of my sermon last night. And it says, or it begins It is dark. It's so dark. It's so dark, I'm trying to get my bearings, but that is impossible. It's oppressive. It's stifling. I'm lost. Where am I? Where do I go? Why, Lord, why am I here? And then I hear a sound. 
It's so big and so rich that I am undone. But even more impossible to that is that that sound is so beautiful. It's intoxicating. It's engrossing. It pulls me in. But even more than that, even more magnificent than the sound is what comes out of it. The light begins to flash all around me in its splendor, in its vibrancy. All the colors of the rainbow appear before me. The power, the majesty, the glory of it all. I am so at peace in this moment. Everything is good. All around me, things begin to form and shape and come into being. The land appears. I begin to see mountains. I begin to see trees. I see everything in front of me. The sea, the sky, everything parades out in majesty. The glory of the sound, the glory of the light. Everything begins to swirl and dance. The moon comes, the sun comes, the stars. They're all there swimming in the sea of the sky and space. Creatures great and small begin to come into being. They show up and they swim and they twist and twirl underground in the same way the ones in the air fly and flap and swoop and dive and the ones on the ground run and jump and frolic. Everything is finding its place in what has been created. But who is he that made all these things? What is he by which the cosmos was laid out? When will he make himself known? Let me stop there. I love God's word. And God's word hits you in different ways. The story of creation is beautiful in the Bible. It's beautiful when you read it in Genesis. It's beautiful when God said, let there be light. It's beautiful when he talked about creating the stars also. But do you make it personal? So we've been talking about personal stories, and we've been talking about all of these different aspects of a personal story over the last few weeks. But God's story, is it personal to you? Can you imagine yourself in that moment where everything came into being? When he was there and it all popped and it all flew in and it all exploded all around you. Because at that very moment, he was thinking about you. At that moment, when light came into being, when the sun and the moon and the stars and everything was being created, you were a thought in God's mind. You see, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about that personal story. Pastor Paul has been giving us those main ideas each and every week. The first one being that a a personal story is powerful. It's a powerful story. Everyone's got one, and it's powerful because it has emotion tied up in it. The emotion of your own life is wrapped up in the power of your story. So it's easy to share what you know, or even in the difficulty of sharing, it's still powerful. And the second point was, a personal story is a connected story. No one story, or no person is an island, as is written in the classics. None of you are by yourself. Everyone's story is connected, and it's all connected together. It really, truly is a small world, and time is short. We think of, you know, whether you're a a, a long earth person where you think the earth is millions of years old or whether you're a short earth person and you think it's maybe 6,000 years old. No matter what, that time is small and it's short and it's finite and it's all connected one thing to the other. The third one is a personal story is a shared story. Your stories are are better when you share them. You can keep your story to yourself. You can keep your music inside of you, but it's better when you let your music play out, when you let your story be shared, when you give it to someone else. You allow someone to share their story with you. It's meant, a lot of times, the challenges that we have in life, the difficulties that we find in our own situations are not even for us. Yes, we went through them, and yes, we got through them by God's grace, but a lot of times those stories we go through are for somebody else. They need to hear that they're not alone in that moment, in that situation, in that circumstance. So you take your stories and you share them because it will bless someone else. It will change things in their lives. 
And last week, Pastor Paul shared a, a personal story is best when written by God. God's fingerprint is in every story, no matter the situation, no matter their theological view, no matter whether they're a believer or an unbeliever, no matter their racial makeup, no matter what, God's fingerprint is on them. He still created all the hairs on their head. He numbered each and every one of them. It doesn't matter how old or how young that person is, God's story or God has written their story, whether they acknowledge him or not. Whether they acknowledge him or not, their stories are best when they acknowledge that they're written by God. And this week, I only have one big idea for you, even though I just shared four others. And that big idea is that God's story changes everything. God's story changes everything. And so when I shared with you guys earlier what I had written last night, and I kind of pulled it all together, and I said I mentioned that I had done it in a, as a five-minute drill, and that's something that my students, now all of you are so, you should thank God that you never had me as a professor. My students were so traumatized, especially because I'm an IT guy, right? I'm not a, an English major. I didn't teach creative writing or anything like that, but what I did with every class that I ever taught was introduce them to the five-minute drill. Five minutes at the beginning of every class, I give you a topic, and you do something creative with it. So for my programming students, they would write an application that did something creative around the theme that I gave them. For my video students, they went out with the cameras. Everybody ran out of the building, did something real quick, and then ran back in and said, okay, this is what I found. For my art, my my drafting students, they would build something. And no matter what, they would all do something creative within that five minutes. And it was a fun time for me because I was always interested in what I would get. Because you always have those you know, students that are like, go way over the top in the five minutes, and you have the students, always like the minimalist students. It's like, okay, what is the very minimum I can do in this five minutes so Mr. Carlton won't get mad at me? And it all brought me joy. And so that's what I did. Last night I said, okay, set my little timer, five minutes. Now, I can tell you it was not clean like it is there. I did transpose it over to the computer and did some editing because I'm not a great speller. So it was, yeah, it was a mess. But I did manage to bang out quite a bit of that uh, before I was done, which is fun. And that's what I did as I began to pull this together. It was, it was dark and formless when I began to create this message. And so that was what drew me into being dark and formless as I began to think of creation and God's creating. And the, bra- the great thing about that is that nothing can separate us from God. Even the folks that believe that God isn't real, even the people who don't believe in God, even the people who say that it doesn't matter, they c- still cannot separate themselves from God. In this life, God is there. They won't be separated until a particular moment comes. But for now, there is no separation from God. You can't escape him. He is everywhere in everything. He's in the chairs you sit on. He's in the clothes you're wearing. He's in the air you breathe. He's in your heart beating. In everything, God is there. And his story permeates everything. And so that means that every story is his. If he created it all, that means that everything that we create is his. So every story belongs to God. From Genesis to Malachi, where God created the earth, and then when God admonished his people and began to have that moment where it was silent for time, God was there and the stories were there. He weaved those stories together. The children of Israel and how they dealt through the the, the exodus and how they dealt in their time of wandering and how they dealt even in their time of exile and in their times of triumph. God was there through all of it. He was connecting each and every story together, bringing it all together, weaving it all together, creating it all. In Genesis 17, 5, we see how God's story changes everything. In Abram, who received a new, game, a new name when God changed the story. 17.5 reads, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Now today I'm reading from the ESV in case you have your Bibles out and you're looking. It may sound a slight bit different. But remember, the word is the word, and that story is the same. Abraham, who would become the father of Isaac, who was the child promised to be Abraham's heir, whom Abraham didn't even believe he would have. An heir that was a chapter in Abraham's life that he thought had passed. 
Abraham was well past the ages of childbearing from a natural perspective. His wife was well beyond the age of child, or he was beyond the age of child creation, not bearing. And his wife was past the age of childbearing. But in in any case, God began to change their story. And God let them know that they were not given up on. And because of that, we can pick up after Malachi. Because of that change in Abram's story, in Abraham's story, we can pick up after Malachi as we hit the New Testament. We look at the genealogies in Matthew chapter 1. And I'm going to read some of it. I won't read all of it because I know everybody always shakes when they think about reading all of the genealogies. But I want to make a point of understanding something. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Matthew 1, 1. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nation, and Nation the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And I stop there because even in that list of names, there is a connected story that happens. Remember Rahab? Yes, Rahab the prostitute. You remember Ruth and Boaz? And everyone remembers King David. But all of those things lined up, God's connected thread from the beginning, even if you go back from Abraham to Adam, everything connected through and then back through again to King David, and then from King David, if you read on down through, connected through the stories that they knew. The Jewish people knew these folks. They knew the genealogy. They knew their history. They knew. They could see, trace God's fingerprint from the beginning to this point. And then things get a little dicey when Jesus comes. But not only are all stories his, but all these personal stories point back to him. So in every one of these stories, the entire children of God all connected together, pointing back to a God who saves and redeems. So when we look at the way that the Bible and the New Testament kind of classified people, you had the Jewish people, you had the Gentiles. Right. So you had everybody who was a Jew and everybody else. So it was like if you weren't a Jew, then you were a Gentile. OK, so for all of us, uh, I believe we don't have any um, uh, uh, what do you call it? Cultural Jews here in the room. If we do, I apologize. But just about everybody in here would be considered a Gentile. But no matter our stories still point back to us. Because even though with the Jews, when you look in Romans, Romans shares and gives us a little bit about the Jewish people and the Gentile people and how God wrapped up all of the redemptive story between those two. Romans 11, 1 through 5, it says, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Adam, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God held out a remnant, and Israel is that remnant. So they're not a forgotten people. And their story points back to God. It, everything about who they are points back to God. So too, for us who are here, in the same chapter we see the story for the Gentiles, the grace that is afforded to us, how we're grafted into the promise. Romans 11, 11 through 15. It says, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means talking about he's talking about the Jews right there rather through their trespass salvation has come to the Gentiles through the trespass of Israel in their forsaking God killing his prophets ignoring him and ignoring Christ the Gentiles are also now grafted in 
Rather than through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Meaning that they will all, all of God's children, those whom he has called and saved according to his purpose, will come together and be with Christ. How much fuller now when they are re-included in to God's salvation? How much fuller will it be when you are included in God's salvation? Let me pick up right there. Now I'm speaking to you Gentiles. And as much then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Everyone is included. We're all grafted in together. God's plan is greater than his the children of Israel. It was greater than the Gentiles who were lost. It encapsulated everything. God's story changes everything in our lives and in the lives of those who felt as though they had an exclusive connection to God. And lastly, in the same way that all stories are his and all stories point to him, all stories are for his glory. Every story is for the glory of God. There is nothing that exists that is not for his glory. Everything was created for his glory. The songs we sing are for his glory. Our technology, whether uh, somewhat antiquated or pretty new relatively, no matter what, it's all for his glory. You and I are for his glory. Our births were not for our parents to be able to say, oh, look at my cute baby. Or say, you know, look at my child who has gone off to college or look at my son, the doctor, or my daughter, the physicist, or whatever that might be. It doesn't matter. That is for God's glory. He knit you together in your mother's womb for his glory. He numbered the hairs on your head for his glory. He counted your fingers and counted your toes and marked out the days of your life. For his glory. He marked out the situations and circumstances that you will run into for his glory. Those stumbling days were for his glory. Those days of triumph when you were flying, they were for his glory. Everything is for his glory. Whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, it's for his glory. Romans 9, 21 through 24 says, Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump some vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews also, but also from the Gentiles. Whether believer or unbeliever, your story is his and it's for his glory. So for those who lean on the theological side of, you know, everything is preordained and predestined and God is taking care of all of it and it's there and it's his and no matter what, it's going to come to pass, you can have that moment. Or if you're on the other side of the theological spectrum where it's I've got to get out and I've got to make sure that people recite the prayer and that they seek after God and we want them to be saved, which everybody should do. Okay, so no matter where you fall theologically, everyone should be out there going and saving and 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 working with who God has put in your life so that they can be saved. But no matter where you fall, God has chosen some and others will not. But it's all for his glory. It's all for his glory. The believer's story for those of you who are believers, is supposed to be marked by power and an abundant life. Now, don't get tripped up by that. I'm not talking about American abundance, okay? So a lot of times we get tripped up because one of our biggest exports out of the United States overseas from an evangelism perspective is a gospel that says you should have everything and never lack anything. And if you, are, if you do lack, the reason why you lack is because your faith is low. That is false 
doctrine. The Bible does not say that everyone will be rich. What he does say is we'll all have riches in him. That having him takes care of everything else. So while you might not have everything that your friend has or your neighbor has or your coworker has, you have Christ and that is enough. If you have more, then that means that much is required of you in order to take care of those who need, who have need. But that doesn't change the fact that your sufficiency is found in Christ, not in your 401k or your bank account. It's all for his glory. And so your life marked by abundance is about the contentment in Christ. It's about living a life that, that, that rises for him. But I know we get all kind of caught up with that idea, like it says in the Bible, it says that God makes his sun rise on evil and the good and, and, and sends the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Yes, that happens. So sometimes good things happen to bad people. And sometimes bad things happen to good people. And I use the air quotes with the good and the bad because good and bad is subjective. Especially when we're the one deciding who's good and who's bad. That's why in the garden it was the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. When you dwell over here in knowledge of good and evil, you are making an assumption call that is not for you to make. Stay over here in the tree of life where you will live and have abundance in Christ. At the end of time, you will see. At the end of your story, God is there making sure that you understand what true abundance is. Revelation chapter 20, 11, 12, and verse 15. I skipped a little bit, but I apologize. I, I got too many scriptures. So, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, the earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. For the believer, that moment is a moment of joy. And we have that, uh, we we used to tell this joke um, back in one of our old buildings where, you know, how it says every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now that's not the joke, okay? that's, That's the word, okay? But the joke is, Well, you know the reason why every knee will bow, right? Some knees will bow willingly. Other knees will be broken. But everyone will bow before God when he comes. Some will be so overwhelmed that they will cry out, Lord, let the mountains fall on us because we can't stand. And others will come to the judgment seat broken. And at that point, it's too late. So as we close out this series... I would be remiss to ask you to consider your story. Does yours recognize that there is an author? Does your story show God's fingerprint? I mean, it shows it. It's there. God's fingerprint is all over it. But when you write your story, does God bleed through it? There are so many stories that are ignorant of him. I don't know about your circle, but I know mine. There are many stories that are ignorant of God. And that's not ignorant in the bad thing. They just don't know. They think they know. You know, we're all big cerebral types. We're all very smart. We all think we got it understood. So what are we to do with that? What am I to do with that? Because, of course, you guys are all evangelizing everyone that is around you. But for me, what do I do with that group? Well, God has commissioned me to go and make disciples. He's commissioned me to talk to those people who are around me. He has gotten me mixed up in some very interesting discussions online and some very interesting discussions at bagel places and coffee shops and at Walmart and everywhere else that sometimes I find myself trying to figure out, God, why do you keep doing this to me? But he has said, go and make disciples. So that means that when I, somebody says something that I'm like, well, you know, it's not really true. I can't shrink back from that and just like, well, let me just let that stand. You can't. Does that mean you run up on them with your Bible in your hand and you, no. 
but it does mean that you make sure that your story displays the glory of God. And when you correct and when you talk and when you live and when you have those conversations with people around you, that what comes out is Christ. And that's what bleeds through as you share with them. That the reason why things are going wrong has nothing to do with uh, a God who doesn't care. In a lot of cases, it's because you've got a God who cares too much. He said, I'm patient so that none would be lost. He could come now. And those who are saved are saved and those who aren't, who aren't. But he says, I am patient, not wanting anyone to be lost. And God has commissioned all of us to go out and remind those storytellers around us that there is a story that is greater than every story. That there is a story that when you add it to yours, you know, so if this was my story, the story of Carlton, and I take that story and I do like this, and I say, you know, okay, because my story is not very long, right? Because I'm not, you know, I haven't been around for a long time, so my story is really small, okay? And when I take his story, the story of God, and I put my story in here like this, you can't see my story. My story is different. But when I share my story, my story sounds like this. And when God is at that moment and he's going back over things, he's reading the story, and he's looking through, and he's talking about his son and how his son's going to come and save those who are wandering in the desert. And he's saying, I gave them all these rules so that they would know that they couldn't do it on their own, but my son is coming. And he looks over here and he says, oh, they're fighting against their enemies and I'm going to save them so that they know that I am real, but my son is coming and my son is coming and my son is coming and my son is coming. And Carlton's in there somewhere too. And my son is coming and my son is coming. He's coming back to this world. And as they sing their psalms, they know that the Christ is coming and Carlton is going and he's there, but he's reading his word, and he's trying to understand, but, you know, Jeremiah says this, and Jeremiah says that. He's pointing back to my son. My son is coming. I love my son. My son is so amazing, and I go through this entire thing, and Jesus and Christ and God is reading through and looking through that story, and, and at the end of it, when my time has come, and I stand before that seat, and God begins to judge, he says, who is here to accuse you? All I see is my son. And I love my son. And my son was there with me when I created everything. So when I look at you, I don't see your stuff. I see my son. I don't, I don't even know where you are. Where, 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 I mean, I know you. I know you. I knitted you together, Carlton. I knitted you together. I put you in, in place. I put you together in your mother's womb. I watched. I set all this up. But you are the righteousness of Christ. Good job, my servant. Come on with me. But there will be some where when it's time, all God will have to look at is this. I don't know what to do with that. The question for you, for everybody who's listening to this message, whether you're online, whether you are watching us on TV, no matter where you might be hearing this, somebody gave you a CD, I want you to know that God wants your story. He wants it included, and he wants it covered. So don't let this moment, no matter how ordinary and every Sunday and every day it appears to be, to miss the point. All of this is nice. Sunday morning, you know, we've got nice comfy chairs. It's heated in here. There's no wind whipping through, you know, like some of my friends in Africa whose church is open air. Or the guys who I'm going to be visiting next year, I was telling them about my trip to Peru where we're going to help them build their church because the building caved in and they have their moments of worship outside because they don't have a physical building to be in. But they're not going to let their story be lost and they grow and they go out and they share and we're called to do the same thing. 
Because if your people, the people that are around you, the people you see day in and day out are really important to you, you will share and you will talk. I know it's hard. I'm an introvert too. I don't like it. But God is amazing. And I want everybody to know. So what will you do with what's left in your story before you get to Revelation? Because the thing is, there's no more pages. Okay? This thing is going to come to a close. And it's going to come to a close when you least expect it. You're not going to get a big countdown clock like we have in the beginning of service. Like, all right, guys, five minutes before service starts, Jesus is coming back today. No. It's going to happen. It's going to be in the twinkling of an eye, the flash of lightning. It's going to happen. And I don't want you to be lost. And I don't want those around me to be lost. So I want my hand to be found working no matter what the situation and what the circumstance. And it's not easy, but it is simple. Do what God told you to do. If you love him, you will keep his commands. So I'm going to stop there because I love all of you. And I want to pray. So what I want to do this morning, because I, I just want to, and God is telling me to do this, in my, you know, in, 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 in my prep time, this is what I wanted, he was leading me to as I was working through this. I want everyone to pray for everyone. So we've got a, 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 a sanctuary here, and we've got some space. So if you find some space around you where there's no other person to pray with, don't take that as an opportunity to sit by yourself. So everybody get up. Everybody find somebody to sit with and pray with. And I want you to pray for their story and for their salvation. Remind them who God is. Pray over them and pray for them in Jesus' name. Can we do that? All right. So now everybody's supposed to get up. It's not for show. I mean it. All right. So let's pray. Father, we are excited because of who you are. And God, I am leading my friends, my family in prayer this morning for their souls, knowing that you have saved those whom you will save. So God, this morning, I ask that your Holy Spirit would resonate and continue to resonate in those lives that you have already jumped out of. And for those who are still looking for you, God, I ask that you would begin to resonate in their hearts, to change them on the inside. For those who are younger, God, give them a life full and full of your energy and full of your power and full of your passion to, to push them all the way from their genesis to their revelation. And for those who are further along in their story, God, give them the energy and the power to continue to put their hands to the plow and their feet to the road as they go out and they work. God, save those, love those, and be with those who need you most of all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So as the worship team comes back up,